Hello and welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent episode for you. But before I go ahead, if you have not subscribed, subscribe to the channel and share with your communities in healthcare. And also I'd like to acknowledge our global partners and sponsors, Spirit Digital. Check them out. And also ASCOM Specialists in Healthcare Wearables and Digital Monitoring, our series sponsors. But before uh, any, any other announcements, I'd like to introduce Bianca Rose Phillips. It's our guest today. is a digital health strategist and lawyer. Bianca, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Oh, fantastic to have you here. I've been following your great work and also congratulations on your uh, event last week and you're very engaging in getting all the digital health community together. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. So let's go straight to the questions. And the first question that I have for you is, uh, what considerations do we need to be aware of with regards to digital health law? Okay, well, firstly, I'll define what digital health law is, as that might, might help provide some context. So digital health law is a specialty area in law. You might know of other areas such as constitutional law, criminal law, medical law, intellectual property, tech law. And usually we think of digital health as sitting within medical law or tech law as kind of a sub subspecialty or a niche area. So we can think of it that way, but digital health law has really developed into its own specialty with lawyers around the world uh, focusing on this niche space. The second point is that digital health law has four branches and we usually focus on one of those branches, which is compliance considerations or substantive law but there's starting to be more of an awareness of the fact that there are these other three branches that we should be considering on strategy um, considerations and and further reasons so let's look at an example for a moment uh, patient empowerment is a good one to demonstrate the importance of digital health law and I think one of the distinguishing features of digital health is that, you know, when compared to, say, other advancements in medicine, is that it really pay places a focus on uh, patient control, patients having control over their lives and over their health. And it seeks to change fundamentally the culture of medicine from a patriarchal approach to at least a collaborative model. So it's important, therefore, to consider how the law either supports or, or perhaps does not support to the best of its ability uh, that objective. And if we look at the laws around patient empowerment, there's actually a good set of laws there to protect patients, to protect their rights at, at present. When you compare that to the rights of, say, a physician themselves, there's definitely a, a lack uh, of, of cover, you know, coverage there in terms of um, their privacy protections and other rights that a physician you know, might, might need. And this is important because if we want a collaborative model, then the law needs to truly support a collaborative model. And the law and the lawmakers will define our rights as citizens, as you know, physicians and and uh, patients in this field. So really important that we hone in on digital health law and all of the various considerations. Oh, thank you for that. Super interesting. I mean, of course, it's your area of expertise and your niche, but some of these uh, particular issues we're not even aware of. So it's very uh, educational for our audience and, and everything. And we talk a lot about patient engagement, patient empowerment, even now, a lot of pharma companies, as you know, they're talking about uh, patient design, design thinking, but also behind that, the supportive law, as you described, it's extremely important. So, I mean, it's actually um, really refreshing to hear that because uh, we never really considered this aspect, you know, very educational. Thank you so much. That's true. Thank you. Well, going to the second question, and you have designed a framework called Eight Pillars 
of digital health law making and tell us what are they and can you expand on that please sure thank you for the question um, i'm very pleased to share this framework with the audience and I do have uh, some publications around this as well. So I could go into some detail on what led me to create this framework and the process that I went through. Um, there is certainly a methodology that I use to develop this. Um, essentially, I wanted to codify the digital health lawmaking process. So I enrolled in a PhD program just over five years ago, and I was awarded a scholarship to spend a few years to unpack questions on digital health lawmaking. And that's how I came to discover the eight pillars of the digital health lawmaking and the digital health revolution. The eight pillars are already embedded within law. It was more a matter of discovering them and explaining them so that we can consider them in the context of digital health and give them a structure and a frame, put them into a framework. It essentially, doing this process was like putting the mirror up to digital health, at least to digital health lawmaking, to reveal what we have been doing all of this time and to reflect on those uh, various aspects. So let's look at the, the, uh, the pillars. There are eight. Accountability of lawmakers for the reasons of their decisions, human rights and law, clinical benefit, societal benefit, harm reduction, risk reduction, business case, still a very important, and public consultation. You can consider this as being you know, a values framework or a principle-centric framework for digital health. And I'm really challenging businesses and lawmakers to consider the eight pillars in this way, in a structured way. As I mentioned, it's already part of the process that we, that we use, that many organisations use without even maybe realising it because most organisations have a sense of their values and oftentimes um, you know, these values kind of go to the core of uh, you know, democratic principles. Now, digital health is going to fundamentally challenge and change humanity. So we're not talking about small matters here. We're talking about something quite big. You know, this could be the evolution of, hum of humanity in a sense. So politics, law, the concept of power and competition are going to be important in how we approach digital health. And I think if your lens or your view is too narrow, you might struggle to really compete against players who have this uh, broader strategy uh, with teams supporting them to not make errors from times past. Look at, say, so some social media organisations um, to not go down that path towards, you know, actually progressing humanity forward with a, a strong values framework. Well, fantastic. I was certainly not aware of some of them. I'm sure many businesses probably focus on the business guys, accountability, but disregard many of the pillars. So actually very interesting also from a competitiveness point of view, but also from an impact of uh, you mentioned impacting humanity and you know I'm very involved in digital health and wearables and certainly my vision is that wearables can change the world and impact humanity. So these pillars sitting behind the company's ethos is extremely, extremely important. Very, very interesting. I, I also learn and I also see the value of using them and getting them I mean, behind the company strategy. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and the third and last question, Bianca, is what are the repercussions of health data ownership from a legal and regulatory standpoint? Thank you. This is such an important question for us to have in mind in digital health. Now, we, we still can't really decide on ownership of the human body, yet alone data. Um, that's one point. Secondly, these are very sensitive topics where people feel quite strongly about what is right versus wrong based on their own uh, opinions. However, if you don't really consider the shades and the nuances in the debate around ownership, you're really missing a proper and considered debate where you can really hone in on philosophy, for example, and, you know, epistemology, ontologies. Um, you could then go down the, the pathway of law, legal theory on subjects like autonomy, legal rights, 
ethical principles, court cases, legislation, practical realities, including economic and financial, and the interplay of all these various considerations. So digital health law provides us with, you know, a, a really good way of analysing the com complexities of this topic, um, because it is a complex one. There are also theories like the incommensurability thesis of Henry S. Mather that we can use to help us deal with, you know, sorting out competing interests and values that we may confront when we are looking at a topic like ownership. So it's a it's a really um, a really challenging one. Uh, for me personally, I guess it's not really my job to put forward what I believe to be the best decision on what I feel to be right or wrong. On my personal view, it's more, I guess, the job of, of lawyers, of, of strategists to put forward uh, a well-reasoned argument for a given approach. And um, ultimately, the decision on ownership will be one that's decided by lawmakers alongside stakeholders. Now, I think that if stakeholders want to put forward a convincing case on data ownership, whether it's one argument or another or a combination of ideas uh, they'll need maybe to to consider this a little bit further because at present i would say even some of the biggest organizations in the world and some of the uh, individuals who i'd say are some of the smartest people in the world are not convincing even me yet alone i'm not sure how they're going to convince lawmakers of the said argument that they're putting forward so a topic like data ownership could be considered even in the context of the eight pillars that I mentioned. And that's a way that you could really go through an argumentation process that balances a range of rights and ideas. Um, myself and other lawyers could really help companies to put forward you know, convincing arguments and strategies that are considerate of law, philosophy, ethics, uh, the legal system and politics, because after all, that's very much what we're trained to do and where we feel comfortable. Uh, thank you, Bianca. And certainly data ownership is, is very interesting, complex. Uh, you know, I've been in many conferences around the world and we, share, we talk a lot about who owns the data and data security. And sometimes, to be honest with you, I get a little bit frustrated because you just go around in circles and exactly. having this debate for years and years. And sometimes when I go to an event and people talk about data, I think, oh my God, there we go again. Here and we go and, again, and exactly. Spend, I spend hours talking about it and you don't really get anywhere. But anyway, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bianca, before I, before I wrap up, <laughs> and thank you for your time and everything. I, I finish all my episodes in a um, peculiar way, I might say which is not really a question, but it's one minute of fame, okay? Oh, so you, okay. you can talk about anything whatsoever, uh, family, uh, personal achievement, uh, professional achievements, and you have so many, uh, company, your work, you can talk about anything whatsoever. So one minute of fame, over to you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, okay, well, my website, please, please have a look at my website. It's biancarosephillips.com. I have a tab there called Digital Health Think Tank. That's my business. Um, so you can see a list of my services there. Something very exciting to announce is that my book is um, coming out in August and I'll be you know, inviting members of the digital health community to the launch of that book. Um, the book is called Making the Digital Health Revolution. And I look at the structural elements and the logical um, aspects of creating digital health laws and philosophy and ethics. And it's, it's fascinating. So I hope that you'll all um, have a look at the book. And the great thing about the book is it also includes a checklist of the eight pillars that I mentioned. So it, I've created a checklist version of the eight pillars. Um, it's really a suggested checklist. It's not something that you would necessarily follow exactly. You can mould it to your organisation, but but those who buy the book will will get access to that checklist. Uh, what else can I say? Um, hi, mum and dad, if you're watching, <laughs> I don't know if they'll watch this. They watch all of my uh, all of my stuff, and they're very uh, they're amazing parents. I'm very lucky to have them, and uh, great family and friends and uh, children, husband, and um, just 
so proud and grateful to be part of this amazing digital health community. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bianca. What a nice way to end. Um, I'm a fan of your work. I believe you're making a huge contribution and everybody in, in digital health knows it now. Personally, thank you so much for contributing to the show, sharing your expertise, your insights and, the, and your time today. Thank you and thank you for everything that you're doing to advance digital health and you know you're such a great support to others and such a wonderful person so um, it really is wonderful to be connected with you. Oh, thank you Bianca. So I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you so much okay. to all the Thanks. viewers. To all the viewers make sure you subscribe, share with your communities and acknowledge our partners and sponsors again. Check out Spirit Digital and ASCOM, our series sponsors, specialists in healthcare wearables and uh, digital monitoring. And I'll see you all next time.